Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Matthew Pullen. I'm uh, SVP here at LSX and one of the directors of the HealthSpan show. Uh, delighted to welcome you to uh, our interactive roundtable hosted by uh, one of our partners, Bayer Consumer Health. Uh, we're going to get started. I'm just continuing to admit people uh, all the time as uh, sort of latecomers come to join us. Uh, but we're going to kick off uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, the team at Bayer today are going to be exploring uh, ideal approaches to partnership uh, from academia and industry and how it allows both sides to uh, develop and grow. I know the team have got some really great content uh, to get through, uh, but it is worth mentioning that this session is interactive and I really would encourage you to get involved in the session as much as possible. Uh, we are in a Zoom meeting. I'm sure many of you will be uh, familiar with that format. Uh, whilst I will ask you to mute your sound for the time being, uh, if you can, it would be great if you can turn your camera on. Uh, it's always really good to, to put a name to, to some of the faces. Uh, and additionally, please do feel free to ask any questions or comment at any time uh, during today's sessions. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to say, uh, any comment you'd like to make, uh, please just use the chat function below uh, to post any of your remarks. Uh, and our moderator, Christina, will be keeping an eye uh, on that uh, throughout proceedings. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, our moderator. Uh, Christina Bursfeldt is a global com business partner, R&D uh, and product supply at Bayer Consumer Health. Um, Christina, over to you. Thanks, Matt, for the uh, great in uh, introduction and welcome everyone to this interactive roundtable on how to best partner in the healthcare industry. As Matt says, I'm Christina Busfeld and I'll be your moderator for the upcoming session. Um, so for us, it's very important uh, that this is an interactive uh, session. We really want to hear from you. And it's really great that so many of you are joining us today. I think we are more than 50 people um, today. So it would be really, really great if you could share your thoughts, your inputs, your questions. Uh, this is what this session is basically designed for. Um, we will start with a few introductory thoughts and input from Team Bayer before we open then the session for your input. And I'm very, very happy that I'm uh, joined here today by two of my great colleagues from Consumer Health. We have Norel Hotcher-Mohalis and Stephen Beveridge uh, joining us today. And I uh, pass it over to Norel and Stephen for a few introductory remarks. Hi, thanks, Christina. And you did a beautiful job at saying my last name. I know she, uh, she practiced that for everybody. Um, so hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, I'm Norel. I'm the Global R&D Category Director for our consumer pain and heart health businesses. Um, super quick background, kind of why I'm here, because I know I am in an R&D category role, um, but I have uh, been involved in partnerships for essentially my entire career um, from all sorts of different angles. So I actually started my career uh, in university technology transfer um, and then uh, worked on a number of different startups uh, and ultimately ended up moving into various business development roles within the consumer good industry. So looking forward to the discussion today, uh, hopeful that this kind of 360 degree uh, view of partnerships that I have can help provide some interesting perspective. Okay, over to Stephen. Thank you, Norel, and thank you, Christina, for the great introduction. And thank you also from my side for the great attendance we have this afternoon, uh, while we discuss best practice in partnering and I'm really looking forward, uh, as Norel just said, uh, to a fruitful discussion. Uh, and great insights. And I would encourage you also, as Matt has already uh, mentioned, and Christina, if you have questions, post them in the chat. And uh, if you uh, want to be shown and, and um, uh, voice them verbally, uh, please uh, come forward and uh, turn on your cameras, and then we can uh, look forward to your questions. Um, I've been with External Innovation and Partnering um, since September 2019. I'm responsible for digestive health and nutritional health, and I'm based in Basel, Switzerland. And with that, I hand back to Christina. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So before um, we, we start the discussion, we were thinking uh, we want to share some very, very quick background information about Bayer and the consumer health division of our, co of our company. Don't worry, this is not going to take ages, but just to provide you with a bit of like who we are information. So um, Stephen, if you move to the next slide, Bayer is a life science company with three divisions, consumer health being one of them. Uh, we have a crop science business and also a pharmaceuticals business. Um, some key data for um, 
for Bayer in the fiscal year 2020. Stephen, the next slide, please. So you can see we have uh, more than 40 billion euros uh, of sales, uh, nearly 100,000 employees. And uh, what is maybe most interesting for you guys, we spend nearly 5 billion euros a year in R&D investments. And uh, we are active uh, in, in more than 80 countries. Um, so this is like the buyer, the, the buyer corporate setup. And now let's dive a bit deeper into the buyer consumer health uh, division. Um, so as you can see, um, we have a, a very strong um, portfolio of consumer brands. Um, we have more than five billion. Uh, we have we, we made more than five billions of sale in 2020. Um, we are based in Basel, um, but we also have hubs across all um, uh, main uh, uh, across across the world and all the main regions, as you can see here. Um, on the right. So the, the consumer health business is really a global business, which I think is also important um, to know when, when thinking about partnering with a company. So now let's, let's dive a bit deeper into, into the portfolio um, we do. So we, are, we have a portfolio of nearly 200 consumer brands worldwide uh, with leading positions in the categories um, in, in, in which we compete. Um, there are, you know, brands like aspirin and Aleve in the pain and cardio category. In nutritionals, we have brands like Redoxin um, or One a Day Allergy. We have Claritin in dermatology. We have brands like Bepantene and Canistin. And in digestive health, brands like Miralax, Iberogast, uh, or Reni. So we want, and this is also like our purpose, we really want to enable consumers around the world to take charge of their everyday health needs um, to better care for themselves. So this is our, our consumer health purpose. And how are we doing this? Um, of course, innovation is key um, to come up always with solution that, solutions that, definitely, that then help consumers uh, taking better care of their own health. And so within consumer health R&D, there is an organization, there is a team that is working on then connecting with potential partners because we are convinced we, won't, we can't do this alone. We want, we want to um, deliver on our innovation aspiration um, together with partners. And this team that is connecting with those partners is called external innovation and partnering. And I hand over to Stephen now because he is a member of this wonderful team, and he will provide a few insights on who uh, external innovation and partnering are and what they do. So, Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, glad to uh, give you a brief introduction on who we are at EIMP, why we value partnerships, and how we uh, approach these. So, if I go to slide one, uh, this is uh, EIMP. So EIMP, as Christina mentioned, we are a critical part of R&D's frontline focus, identifying and engaging external partners to bring both new differentiating uh, science and technology to the organization, which helps us create unique, ownable, sizable and enduring innovations. And as you can see, our team is diverse in geographic footprint, culture, experience and languages. We have dedicated team members uh, for all categories that you've just seen from Christina, who are located around the globe, sitting in Switzerland, the UK, but we also have a strong presence in North America, Latin America, as well as the Asia Pacific region. Each one of our team are advocates for potential partners and help ensure a seamless, transparent partner experience. They serve as dedicated relationship managers to provide companies with a single point of contact throughout their interactions with their consumer health. So as Christina said, we are passionate about innovating to meet unmet needs and partnerships are a critical piece of how we drive that forward. They enhance our ability to empower the transformation of everyday health for consumers. We believe a strong collaboration must benefit all. Partnerships thrive on mutual benefit and contribution, a shared vision and efficient coordination. All partners need to feel that the relationship has met their needs and partners needed to be, need to be prepared to learn from each other to ensure the relevant capabilities of each are utilized. That's why we always make sure to first look at each potential relationship with a totally fresh view as we want to create a bespoke fit for purpose partnership where everyone wins. 
We understand that working with the large organizations such as ourselves can be confusing, complicated and frustrating. But as Norel will tell you in a moment, we are experienced in navigating all sorts of partnerships from investments, licenses and joint development to early stage research collaborations. We do take an individualized approach to establishing a partnership pathway that makes sense for everyone. And our EMP team strive to humanize the process of working with a large company and think of our partners as an extension of our own team. So this is who we are and what we do at EMP in a nutshell. And I'm now going to hand back to Christina. Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the overview and uh, humanizing uh, partnering. I mean, this is also what we're trying to do in the session. Um, because uh, Norella is now also showing uh, or sharing a few examples for recent partnerships, because I mean, it's all good to hear about the theory, but there is also some nice practice and best practice we would like to share with you. So Norella, over to you. Thanks. So uh, when I joined Bayer, it was about two years ago, um, I actually joined in the external innovation and partnering group. Um, I, I probably got kicked out because I think I was the only person that only spoke one language. Um, so they had to give me the boot. Everyone else had a, uh, a whole lot more value there. Um, but one of the most exciting aspects for me um, when I joined was that as an organization, we have access to essentially explore and execute on any sort of partnership that you can imagine. Um, so I was super, super excited about that. There were no limitations and we could really create a bespoke partnership for whatever made sense for what we were doing. Um, so capabilities from research collaborations, uh, we could do joint development, uh, licenses, uh, even investments and acquisitions. Um, so it was, you know, kind of really that that drove me to join the organization to have that exciting toolbox um, of ways that we can partner. And uh, when I was in that role, uh, a lot of times you're speaking to new companies and probably one of the first questions that I get is, you know, okay, give me an example of a partnership that you've done you know, similar to maybe what you're suggesting with us. Um, and it's always difficult to answer this question because of course there is, you know, confidentiality and, you know, certain things that you can or can't talk about, um, but you do want to provide a, a lot of color um, to, the, to the partnerships that you may be having with future companies. Um, and so we pulled together a couple of examples. Um, and if you want to hop over to the next slide, um, I'll just bring up two today. Uh, yep, perfect. Um, I'll bring up two today that I think are kind of interesting, um, and you may or may not have seen them already. They've received uh, certainly some, some news press over the past year. Um, but in this uh, first company, Care Of, we've taken uh, a majority investment, um, and Care Of is a personalized D2C company. Uh, and I bring this up because I think what's most exciting um, about this example uh, is that we start to talk about uh, all sorts of recent global trends in partnerships. Um, so we talk about here, uh, you could essentially uh, look at different business models as a reason to partnership, uh, is a reason to partner where you can look at different channels. Um, and then of course, also the personalized trend, uh, the trend around personalized nutrition. Um, the second example that I'll bring up, if you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, so in this example, uh, it started, I guess, in about early 2020. Um, and we entered into a, a joint development agreement with a company called Azitra. Um, and this is a, a US-based clinical stage medical dermatology biotech company. Um, and we went into this uh, partnership to really better understand the skin microbiome um, and start to look into potential treatments uh, for adverse skin conditions and disease. Uh, but I bring up this partnership as, in, in, as an example because um, what I like most about this one is it didn't stop there. Um, it didn't stop with the initial uh, joint development. Um, and we continued to work closely with the Zitra um, and ultimately decided, I guess, a bit later in 2020 that we did want to continue our uh, relationship. Um, and we leveraged our corporate investment arm, so a program called LEAPS, uh, which looks to invest in transformational technologies. Um, technologies that have the potential to really shift the paradigm from treatment, which is what we were looking at initially, um, all the way through to cure. Um, so really looking forward to tracking this one um, and seeing where we progress um, after that investment. So I'm sure we'll get dig deeper into partnerships, kind of pick them apart in the discussion today. Um, I bring this one up with the Zetra because I think it's kind of cool. Um, when we started that initial relationship, um, we never assumed that we would ultimately be entering 
um, a LEAPS investment is the next logical step. Um, but we really took a look at that partnership, thought about what made the most sense and worked with the company to figure out what we both needed um, to make Next Step successful. Um, and uh, with that, really excited to get into some discussion. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Christina um, and hopefully uh, hear from all of you. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Norel and Stephen, for providing these insights. Um, so now you know a bit more about who we are, um, how we approach partnering, and why we think partnering is so important to drive innovation. And now we'd love to hear from you. Um, so now let me kick off our discussion. And I've, I'm already seeing quite a few questions coming in. So I would like to then even start with taking up the one, um, I think it's a question on grants for apps, which is also a, um, um, what is the relationship with buyer grants for, for uh, grants for app partnership, Lawrence, right? That is a question that came, came from you. Exactly, your... exactly. So, so do you work with the team? Mm -hmm. Do you have to go through that team uh, to reach you? Um, Norel uh, or Stephen, who would like to no. comment on grants for apps? I'm happy to take this one. Um, grants for apps, I think the way that it started is a little bit different. Um, than sort of what it has uh, molded into today. Um, we do work closely with the company, um, with, the, with the company, with the, with the, I guess, part of Bayer that manages that. Um, I wouldn't say that there's any specific order with which people would need to either connect with them or connect with us first. We do uh, speak to them rather frequently. Um, oftentimes they'll get submissions to their program that isn't quite right and they'll reach out to the EINT team or different categories within the organization to say, hey guys, you check this one out. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I'd say the relationship is we work closely. Um, there's no specific process by, by which we have to work with them. Any further questions on grants for us? Right, okay. Because then there is another question, Rachel. Um, you, you were interested in like entry points, right? Would you like to yeah. speak up? Hi, Narelle, good to see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the example you gave for care of, it started with a partnership and then an investment. Um, what is Azitra, the- Azitra, Azitra. Azitra, excuse me, yes, Azitra. Is the right entry point, you know, if we have a relationship with obviously someone in EI um, and P to go through you, or if companies are looking for potential investment or other sorts of relationships like licensing, what have you, there are so many different options, um, would they start with um, LEAP? I'm, 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 I'm happy to take that, yeah. Uh, thank you for that question, Rachel. Uh, as as Morel said before, uh, we actually talk uh, quite frequently with LEAPs and, and there's no right or wrong way to do things. Um, you can come directly to EIP uh, or you can talk directly to LEAPS, uh, our investment arm uh, that's out there. Um, and we talk frequently and sometimes they come up with uh, stuff that's interesting for consumer health. Uh, sometimes we point out uh, a direction, something that will be interesting for them uh, in terms of financing rounds. Um, so either way is fine. It, it'll get to the right person internally uh, because we, we are very well connected internally. So um, there's no wrong way of doing things. And uh, uh, yeah, either, either way is fine. And as a follow-up, is there ever um, a cash infusion or um, investing behind a particular project that one of your potential partner companies is doing? Or is, does all the money change hands through LEAP? So for instance, if I brought you a company that you were interested in and we needed some help, over a last clinical program, even though it's uh, an OTC product, consumer product, is that something that EINP would fund again, or is that something that LEAP would that, invest that, in? That probably depends on, on the type of project. Uh, if it's uh, support, financial support for clinical, as, as you just mentioned, uh, I can imagine that would be, it, it depends on the sum and the kind of clinical, uh, the extent of that, um, which would be R&D finance from our end. Um, if it's something uh, which is more sort of investing and getting a majority stake in a company, uh, including a board seat, et cetera, something like that, then that's something that more is uh, on the leap side. 
so it, it depends on the project by project case. Um, but uh, that's something we would need to discuss. But if it's more sort of supporting on a project basis, um, it's rather going to be R&D. And I Thank just want to add. I just want to add to that because I think that going back to your first point, Rachel, I think this is a really interesting one. Um, and I want to make it a little less about Bayer um, and more about connecting with industry in general, right? Because I remember when I was on the university side and you didn't know who to talk to, right? Organizations are so massive. They're so complex. Do you reach out to, you know, the head of an open innovation group? Do you reach out to the R&D category director? Do you just email everyone at the same time and hope for a response? Um, so I think this is, I think this is kind of a pain point um, on speaking with large organizations. Uh, and part of what we're trying to do at Bayer, and we may or may not be getting it right, and we're open to feedback, um, is really making the people uh, that do the partnerships very visible, right? So we want you to know who we are. We recently launched, I don't know if anyone's seen on LinkedIn, um, it's called a Partner With Us campaign. So we're putting these videos of um, different people across the organization up. Oops, I think we've lost um, we've lost um, Norel. So um, let 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 us then make. Can you hear me now? Are you back again? Yeah, yeah. Mm, that was weird. Okay, I don't know where you guys lost me. Um, <laughs> no, I was just saying. So I think it's really important to have those relationships with people in the company because the truth is, it doesn't matter how you get in. Right. If you can connect with an actual person, um, you know, I I look after pain and cardio, right? But if you send me something. Um, and you're like, hey, can you help me get to the right person on nutritionals? Um, we can make those connections as well. Um, what I will say is that for Bayer, we do have a partner with us email address, um, which is very regularly monitored. Um, it's partner with us at Bayer.com. That will get to the right person. It will get to the right person quickly. Um, but, you know, it, shout at us if you guys think there's, there's a better way to connect. Um, but uh, ultimately, all the different groups talk to each other. Um, so, you know, happy, happy to do that. Yeah. And, um, I think there was a comment, uh, in the chat from Mani. She's saying, uh, even though it's interesting to learn how to access buyer, maybe we should also kind of shift the conversation a bit more towards like how we then, uh, what, what do we think about partnerships? And that was also one of our key interests for you as a, as a group to learn from. So what are then key criteria for you that, 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 that kind of um, make a successful partnership or what, what, what would you say um, is key for you to enter into uh, a sex successful partnering with a bigger company? So uh, maybe we can kind of shift the conversation a bit more towards this one. And maybe Russ, you, you, you asked the question on as a large company, so how do you find the right balance um, so to make it a true partnership and not an imbalanced big company, small company relationship, but maybe you would like to speak up a bit here on what are your thoughts? What would be then an ideal partnership? Um, so maybe Russ, you would like to comment. Sure. Yeah. And thank you for, uh, for that. Yeah. So I, I worked for a large company. I worked for a large company prior when I was at Pfizer, but I always saw that difficulty of a very large, you know, 90,000 employee company working with a 40 supplier ingredient supplier, for example, and how do you, uh, you know, it can be very difficult to not want to use your leverage and your power of the big name and your big brand to overly influence that ingredient supplier. And it, it can be very difficult, but the best examples are when you do have that sort of strategic, long-term visual strategy, really, where you're both looking out for each other in the end, and they're coming up with new ingredients and you're figuring out how to apply those into a finished product. And it's not just a one-time deal where you're trying to save money, it's a long-term plan. There are ways to do it. Um, but I was also curious for others that might be part of big companies, like how do you strike that good balance of not always over leveraging and letting those guys be part of your partners along the, along the trail? You can do it successfully and it works out amazing, but it's also very difficult to get it right. Yeah, very, very interesting. So thank you for that input, Ross. Uh, completely agree with you. Um, it, it, it can work amazingly, as you said, but it, it's very difficult. And I think uh, key uh, for the relationship is, is to involve the, say, smaller company coming from a bigger company, obviously, um, at a very, very early stage and, and uh, try and create that sort of trust element 
uh, and have great communication and involve them in, in everything you do uh, along the way so that they feel like a, an eye to eye level partner at, from, the, from the very start of it. So uh, I think that's what we found was, was, was key for many partnerships that we've done in the past. Uh, but uh, yeah, sometimes it, it doesn't work out and, 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 and that's part of the game as well. And as you said, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to really get it right. Uh, Hey, I think it's important to have an advocate for the small companies that you're working with, right? So I think that um, it's really easy to get kind of wrapped up in being the large company and, you know, talking to a lot, oh, well, we'll deal with them when we can, you know, we're super busy, this, that. Um, but I think if you can put into place a team um, and their responsibility, and, and even if you use the words relationship manager, right? I know it's not super typical in open innovation groups, but assign people the responsibility of, you know, you're the advocate for that company. So regardless of what's going on internally, your responsibility is to ensuring a healthy relationship with them. I think that can start to, to help break down the barriers of like big company, small company, taking advantage, you know, not. Um, so I think, I think that's a really key for me. Any, any comments from the group, maybe from, a, from someone from a, from a small company? Because we've heard Rusk, X Pfizer, us buyer. So maybe there are people who could provide their perspective on this, on this question more from the, the smaller partner viewpoint. I could, um, I'm, I'm happy to share. If you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, great, yeah. Uh, I'm Bashar Saab, the CEO and the chief scientist at Mobile Interactive. We make digital therapeutics, but still a small company. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, you know, I think with any partnership, you really want to match with the weaknesses and the strengths, right? One of the main things that a small company is missing is capital. Um, and, and one of the main things that a big company is missing is the ability to, to innovate quickly. So, you know, from our perspective, the, the partnerships that we like to form with big companies really uh, put that front and center and say, okay, if you give us some um, capital at the onset, we can agree to all sorts of, you know, fine details regarding um, exclusivity within regions or indications, et cetera. Uh, and then we take that and we run and we will develop something that would cost you five, 10 times as much to do internally. And we'll do it in half the time. Uh, and then, and then at the end, if we meet certain criteria, then we can go forward from there. Those are really, that's really like a, a sort of a simple way to think about it. We're short on capital and you guys are short on the ability to, to really make, make stuff happen fast. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a disruptive way. Um, so that's, that's just sort of my two cents in terms of what, what mm -hmm. really tends, what we look for in a bigger partner, uh, if mm -hmm. you're interested in that perspective. Any, any barriers or hurdles you could think of like that come to mind? Well, uh, I mean, nobody likes to part with capital. So the, the first thing that we have to do is ensure, help, help, the, help the big company ensure that this is not going to be money washed down the drain. Um, and so you can, I mean, you, it's always going to be a risk, right? Because if you're truly innovating, you should be taking a risk. Uh, and so we've already done the work to demonstrate clinical validity, benchmarking of our, our, of our objective uh, psychobiometric tools. And so really we tried to structure the partnership in a, in a de-risked way where it's really about applying the technology for a particular use case of value to the big partner in a market that they care a lot about. Um, and so, you know, the big barriers would then be being able to prove yourself, being able to uh, get through a four month discovery process where you really have to open up uh, your, 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 your technology books um, and, and let them see underneath the hood. Mm. Um, but as long as you're a legitimate company, then I think you get through that, those barriers. Um, um, and if you don't, well, that's, that's good actually. Yeah, thanks very much for this input. And Laurence, you also added a few comments. Maybe you would like to uh, provide a bit more background. Yes, yes. So we're Womb uh, Health. Um, it's about women's health, what we do. And we're right now working with, a, with an insurer. And, and I would say three things from our point of view that are working well in that, in that partnership is that on one hand, you cleared out from the beginning what could be the potential business model. Uh, eventually after the pilot, because most of the time it starts with a pilot. Uh, you're paid for the pilot, important, and it goes back to, to the point uh, just said before, capital is a problem for startup, right? So you need to be paid for it. And speed, and it's again about the same thing. It's again about capital, right? If the pilot goes like a year and a half, and then, and then you eventually go to a recurring business model for the startup, it's just way too long. 
for us, um, so so speed. Mm. Mm, yeah, of course. I mean, speed is, uh, I think, at everyone's mind. Talking mm. about innovation, you have to be absolutely fast. Um, Noran and Stephen, any comments from your end on those insights? Curious how you guys, you know, when we talk about it, I think this is a really important thing to talk about. What does each com company bring, right? Large companies bring something, small bring something, medium size. Um, when we think about what we bring as an organization, of course, there's capital, um, but also a lot of times we think that our brands hold significant value, right? Because we have the ability to reach consumers. Um, I know for some companies, this is true, some it isn't. Um, I'd be curious your perspectives on the value that it thinks that you think bringing our big brands um, to your technologies has. Could I uh, say something? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> okay. I took a moment when there was silence there from everyone. So, <laughs> yeah, I have experience of um, uh, contacting uh, Bayer Consumer um, in recent uh, months. Uh, I work as a business development consultant with sort of small, innovative um, companies involved in primarily skincare. Uh, and I've contacted Bayer uh, on a couple of occasions and one is still uh, moving forwards. Um, so I found the process of contacting Bayer uh, very good. Uh, response was excellent. Um, compared to, I have to say, other major companies in the same space as Bayer, some um, with the same sort of setup as yourselves, LinkedIn uh, posts, uh, you know, saying they're looking for innovative uh, partnerships, contact so-and-so, uh, here are all the details, and you do all that, and, and you never hear back from them, which is very frustrating. I have to say, in Bayer's case, I, I did hear back very quickly. Uh, I was put on with the right people in Bayer, uh, and although the, the first time through, it just wasn't a match, the second time through, it, it, it might be um, something which will go a little bit further. Um, the companies I work with are, 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 are small, and, and they're looking to Bayer to give them some sense of, um, you know, the market, uh, the opportunity for their particular product, they have the marketing resources and the money to do that. Um, I guess from our point of view as a small company, there is a huge mismatch. And although Bayer uh, do say they're really interested in talking to small companies, no matter what, it's, it's um, you know, a, 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 a David and Goliath uh, situation uh, all the time and small companies cannot tick every box unlike buyer and sometimes it's very easy for the big company to bring their checklist to the table and of course small companies cannot tick all those boxes so I think it's it's good um, for both to sort of compromise in the early stages and for buyer to accept it this company maybe at this moment in time doesn't have everything that they might want. And maybe to look a little bit closer at what could happen in the near to, to midterm with this company, have they the ability, the innovation to work with Bayer to get there in the end? Whereas at this moment, maybe they're a, a short distance away from, from really getting a positive collaboration going. And, and, and maybe for Bayer to be a little bit more open-minded as to, look, they're a small company, we can help them, they have interesting technology, uh, let's investigate it a little bit deeper and see if there's something there that, that we can work with them on. Hmm. Um, but yeah, in terms of that initial contact, I have to say Bayer were very good. Um, Russ was on, Russ, Hi, with Racket. Russ? Yep, I'm here. Russ, you need to speak to your Racket business development <laughs> guys because I tell you, I have to say, they are not very good at responding. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Russ, but so I, I guess think... this is what we're here for to discuss <laughs> sure. openly. Sure. Yeah. But I think I mean that that's great input, and I think uh, to the point you the points you made. Um, we have another comment here from Linda and she is pointing to advocacy. And I think this is a very nice, oh, and, and Norel has also mentioned that, that it seems like as a small company, you really need an advocate within the organization um, that then also connects you to, to, to others. Um, and as you said, um, those people are not kind of waiting with a checklist. And if you don't fulfill all the, you know, the tick boxes, then you're out of the game. So I, th I think maybe Linda, uh, it would be great if you could provide some 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 thoughts on this on this advocacy piece, if you are yeah, happy sure. to. Thanks. My name is Linda Burkhardt, um, and I work for the GSK consumer healthcare business. I really liked what Russ and Narelle said around kind of advocating for the third party, but I feel like it's also taking it one step further and ensuring that people who don't sit in the immediate kind of external innovation or partnering group value what the third party can bring to the table and yes they might not have the same kind of you know business acumen or model or things that we might value internally but it's just making them aware of well what are they bringing to the table and how does that complement and ultimately make us more competitive yeah and i think we have and mani is also she works for walgreens right and you can you you also agree to this uh what we've just discussed yeah, I think um, I definitely feel like the Goliath very frequently because we're, you know, I, all the partners that I'm working with on every single project my team is working on, I do um, innovation for the Walgreens and Boots own brands. We're looking for lots of innovative partners. They are pretty much all startups right now. We have very, very, very lengthy legal processes and procurement processes that we seem to not be able to flex even if we're trying to get an MVP off the ground, you know, we start with, you know, the whole master service agreement as if we're signing up, you know, GSK as a supplier or j, j like, you know, big corporation and those terms. And, and we've had feedback from startups that like, they don't have the legal resources to, you know, spend, it, it slows everything down. It, it also, I think, limits the number of startups that are actually willing to go through all the pain and suffering to get to the end of actually realizing the final project getting off the ground. So I'm sure others who work in large companies have similar frustrations. I'm, I'm trying to figure out internally how to convince, you know, stakeholders in legal procurement, other departments that it's okay, we need to find a pared down initial kind of agreement to work with to be able to even pilot potential projects. So that's a frustration I've had. I don't know if anyone has any tips, but I've definitely heard similar stories from people at other big corporations. So well, maybe Stephen and Norell, would you like to share some insights? Because in buyer processes, you know, they are fast, they're speedy, everything goes very, very smoothly. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I I'll, I'll comment because it's interesting. I started my career in university technology transfer. And um, part of what I was doing was trying to get in touch with these big companies um, and get them to look at our ideas. So I, I got that other kind of side of the coin experience. And I remember sitting there and thinking like, what's taking so long? And you know, what are they doing? You know, and, and feeling that frustration on that side of things. Um, and then when I jumped over to industry, seeing that there are some very real reasons um, why these Goliath companies are acting the way that they do. Not that it's right or wrong or, you know, whatever other cases, but they're, they're just truths, right? And, and we are complicated. And, you know, I, I think we're always very, um, and maybe this is a topic to talk about, we're always very risk adverse, especially when it comes to a legal perspective, right? Anything we write down, you know, if, if we close out a relationship with a company, could potentially be used against us, right? So there's there's a lot that I think that's going on in the background sometimes, especially when it comes to what we can or cannot say, how we can or cannot say it, and you know what could be used against us if you know worst case scenario we enter into some sort of discovery period. So I think that's kind of my learning on the other side that there's a, there's a whole lot more um, that's that's making these types of big and small uh, company relationships a little bit challenging. Mm. Um, and I hear Nick, Nick, you have your hand up. So yeah. over to you. 
You, Nick, he's muted. Can I unmute him? Any better? Yep. Right, cool. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just take the hand down first. <laughs> well, um, thank you for inviting me to the meeting. I, I work for a small company. Um, we're in a, quite a strong position in the sense that we have a series of large companies that we work with. We are, we are a GLP laboratory and we specialize. In fact, we're the first in the world for totally animal-free testing in vitro um, for safety and efficacy. And I would say from a small company perspective, I mean, I've worked in a larger organizations. I've, I've literally joined this company a month ago. So uh, one of the challenges I'm finding is in smaller companies, you haven't got a huge and vast human resources specialists in absolutely everything from writing an email to, you know, putting a proposal forward. Um, you know, I'm the marketing manager for the organization and I do find myself spread a lot wider than I normally would be in a larger organization. And the biggest challenging that we find as a result of that is when you deal with um, large scale projects like the ones that Bayer leads and his partners, uh, the first and foremost challenge we find is, you know, what's the entry points? What are the projects and requirements? And what actually are the resources and, and you know, strengths that you need from each partner within that project and what they need to deliver? I mean, to define that, to start with, can be a project by itself and it can actually take, you know, quite a considerable time when you have all the things that you need to do, if, if you can understand that. Um, and my biggest question in, in all of this is ultimately, this is a, uh, you know, um, this uh, opportunity that a buyer offers together with its, fact, uh, with its partners um, is geared towards new innovation. And it can be, in my understanding, anything from product development, tech, uh, so anything from the health industry to technology. So how would that work from, for companies that ultimately are more into supporting the delivery of the project rather than developing the end solution? Even Norel, who would like to comment? on Nick's question. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I'm happy to take it, Stephen, if, if, if you want me to give it a, a start. Oh, I think you're on mute. I don't know if you're, okay. Um, so, I, I mean, this is a really good question. And I think we are focusing this discussion a bit more on the end delivery and then the innovation component of it. Um, I will say from our perspective, um, we do look after companies like yours in a bit of a different way. Um, so some of the responsibility on that falls within um, another division. Um, so it falls within kind of our product supply group and, and how they're looking after, I don't want to call it CMOs, but, you know, different, different companies that could, could support us in different ways. Um, so just because I think we're not focused here doesn't mean that that's not a huge focus for us. Uh, actually, when we, we pulled together, I guess, the end of last year, um, what our partner with us strategy was. Um, super exciting, I think it's awesome. Um, but essentially we looked at different pillars of how to approach different companies. Um, and that, that was a separate pillar because I, I, I do think that it needs a separate type of approach. It's, it's, more, it's more repetitive and strategic versus a one-off relationship. And I think um, that should be looked at differently. Thank you. Maybe anyone else uh, from the group who would like to, to comment on, on this question? If not, there is a... Uh, um, hello? This is, yeah. yeah, this is Dayton Oil. I'm with Panasutics Nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've worked with two really big CPGs in the world, including um, one that we're talking about today. We're in a, we're in a relationship with... And, the big, the big thing, everybody has echoed this, it's slow. It puts the small company at risk to put resources with a, with a big company that then can decide not to go forward. And so you have to understand that um, for a small company to enter into a relationship with a big Goliath, I think actually is more of a risk than it is a value at some times. And so <laughs> that's been our experience over the last few years. 
going down the path and then having, for whatever reasons internally in the big companies, they decide not to move forward. And that can be they had bad financial quarters. They've had their innovation team uh, disbanded. They've found a different focus area. It's a number of things that have come forward. So, I, you know, just as a, a warning shot to small companies, the big company is not always your answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what then would like an ideal partner look like for you then based on your experience? I think, I think the ideal partner would set timelines and, and move fast and not, and not just have an ever, I mean, we've been in two partnerships that have lasted multiple years and not, and they just get stuck and there's no yeah. emergency timeline on them. They get, you know, And there should be some set timelines. Like we're going to get to this point in mm -hmm. a year or six months or whatever. And then we're going to say, we're going to make a decision to go forward or not. There just seems to be a lot of, I'll call it dragging small companies along as long as they can. And so quick timelines that are quick and manageable. So both sides and not have the big company bring in 50 people to be part of the project when the other, when the external The little company has 18 or so. It just, it's, it, it just really comes a, and, and I actually have to ask the big companies and I've known because I worked in a really big company and did this on the other side is there needs to be clear ownership internally for the big company who makes decisions, who makes decisions. Because it, it always comes down to, well, I got to ask so-and-so and we got to get a buy-in at this other committee and all that. It's just, It's very frustrating for small companies from that point of view. So I think anything you can do to set timelines and clear decision and who the advocate and who is making those decisions is, is critical. Can, can I ask a follow up to that? Because I, yep. I've, I've definitely struggled with this. Um, and, you know, in the absence of being able to speed things up, right? Let's say that, you know, we're, we're going as fast as we can. Big companies are slow. I get it. What can we do? Um, is, is it transparency? So like, hey, let me just tell you, you know, you have your advocate in the big company. We're struggling with timelines. I, I don't want you to put all your eggs in this basket. So it would being completely open and honest solve that in the absence of being able to speed it up or is that more frustrating? I, no, I, I've, I've never had a problem with them being completely open and honest. Okay. From, I mean, because... Uh, because I, I recognize the champion you have inside as being as honest with you as possible. They have other things that they're really unsure about, mm -hmm. but you remember small companies are burning cash at a rate <laughs> that they can't afford to sit still and wait for decisions to be made. And so it's either that's, that's the big piece. And I think somebody else mentioned, you know, it comes down to capital. I mean, can we yeah. sit, can a small company sit and wait, a month or two months for a decision to be made on whether you're going to do something or is it better for the small company to apply their resources with a, uh, a, a, a smaller company, uh, their own market channel, anything to get cash in the door? Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, to be honest, honestly speaking, these are things even as working For a big company, I think these are things we, we should also do for, for us, for ourselves, not only working with smaller companies, but also working within our company, decision making, speed up processes, clear empowerment. You know, I think these are things we are all kind of um, feeling and we need to get better at not only working with external smaller companies. Um, so thanks very much for this, this input and, and this feedback. I, I would um, say I was work, we were working with a smaller company recently and um after about a month and a half of going back and forth of where they're going to do something the smaller company just said hey we just don't have the resources to do this now mm. and it, we're going to put this on hold and thank you for your time and let's move on <laughs> and to be honest that felt better than <laughs> than waiting <laughs> so anyhow i'll leave it at that um and i had yeah. you know i did work for GlaxoSmithKline for a long time so i was on the other side of these relationships. So I know how hard it is to manage them internally and externally, but mm. being on the other side, it becomes more critical. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. And we have uh, two, um, two questions. So we have uh, Rachel Brown, she, she would like to ask a question. So Rachel, over to you. And then next is Bichara. 
from Mobio Interactive. Uh, he also has his hand up. So Rachel, first over to you and then Bichara. It's, um, we will pass it over then to you. I very much appreciate the comments about how you try to figure out how to navigate this. A um, couple of points. I think transparency does help. Two weeks in the life of a startup is a very different two weeks than in the life of a buyer or large, large company. So not only being transparent, but being accurate is critical. The other piece that I've seen um, having worked in um, and for large companies and now working with a lot of small companies is the payment terms are usually um, disadvantageous to uh, the small companies. So for instance, I'm working on a pilot right now with a small company and a large company um, who probably is represented on this phone. And the 90 day net payment terms means that the company itself has to come up with that cash when part of the whole motivation was, can you help us get to an outcome without you know, us, us bleeding cash. So I don't know if it's, you know, and I've been a, a consultant for a long time and I'm in a lot of these um, payment systems, you know, are there ways to have advantageous payment terms for companies under five employees or under five or $10 million? Or is there a um, better payment terms if you're a minority or women-owned business? Are there ways to have at least the movement of cash uh, be quicker when you're actually in a relationship. Yeah. And then the other piece, as you said, Narelle, is being accurate with time. Those rounding errors, you know, a month or two could be the life um, and the future of a small company where it's a rounding error in a large company. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting comment on like uh, be a bit more flexible with like payment uh, processes. Um, yeah, I think, Norel, this is something we need to discuss with our procurement colleagues, right? <laughs> it's, it comes up all the time, and I've seen proposals, yeah. not necessarily here, but on that, can we, you know, if a company under five people, can we move to a 30-day, right? Make that the small exception um, to the rule. It's a, it's a fantastic point. Yeah, absolutely. So, Bitara, you, you had your hand up as well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so... Um, I just wanted to touch on a little bit of what, what Staten said and a question that um, Narelle asked earlier about the value of the brand. So I, I think you know, Staten gives a good warning, I think for smaller companies like ours when we approach big ones, but at the end of the day, it's not like we're powerless, right? So when we draft our agreements, we include things like you know 50% upfront payment for this project after post-discovery, discovery process is four months long. These are the KPIs. Um, this is how the decisions are made. So we put all this stuff uh, in writing and get them to sign before we start leveraging a lot of our resources. Because we know no matter what, there's always going to be a risk. There's always going to be capital that we have to exert. That's part of doing business. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, it's not like we want to ignore the big companies because um, it, it, you know, part of what I think Norel refers to as brand is expertise, know-how. Uh, particularly knowing the, the, the end user or the patient or the customer and how to reach them, um, having those processes in, in place. That is hugely valuable expertise, that machinery and that expertise to, to, to a smaller company that's really getting into the market and can make a big difference in acceleration. And so we tend to structure all of our agreements with large companies in, in multiple phases, you know, discovery process, no payment, and there's going to be a pilot. And we work out what 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 happens there, um, and it, it, we might even do run a pilot at a loss. But at least there's some de-risk uh, for getting involved and and doing a lot of 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 work. And then after that, we've already got the outline for what things look. And this has worked, you know, quite well in in some cases. And other things, you know, things you know, you know fall apart, but not because of the process. It's falling apart for uh, other reasons. You know, other mistakes or changing priorities or shifting world or whatever. So. I think you know, all these points are, are really great. And what, what's impressed me here right now with, with Bayer is, is a very clear, authentic desire to learn from the smaller companies what makes a good partnership, which is not what I expected this panel or this you know, discussion to be around. Um, and ultimately that's, that's, that gives you guys a huge edge if you internalize the stuff and implement things because that's, that's, that's your best chance at, um, at really innovating uh, in my opinion. Kudos. Well, great. Thank you. Anyone from the EINP team who want to comment? Stephen?
Well, I think uh, maybe Stephen uh, is, is on mute. So um, no, thanks very much. And I mean, this is exactly what, how we framed the session. As I said in my, in my introduction, we really want to leverage this time to also learn from you because I mean, um, this, is, this is the opportunity for us to shape our approach that then kind of fulfills your needs and that we become uh, a potential partner you might be interested in, in partnering with. So um, I have, a, I have a, another rather concrete question, Norel and Stephen, from Paul. Um, so what is then the process or the, the approval levels required at Bayer to then actually make an investment in a small company, for example, to offer funding for, let's, let's say, a, a clinical study? So Norel, maybe you could, you could comment on this one. Mm -hmm. So this probably isn't the answer that you want, um, but it's entirely different on a case-by-case -case basis. And I do think there's a benefit to that, right? We don't necessarily have a process. We do have subjectivity um, in how we explore these. Um, to fund a clinical, uh, again, it's not a typical process that we would do, but I'd say that it has to fit within our strategy. Um, and so, you know, I guess, the process would be to first reach out to our partner with us email, um, and then they would get in touch with one of the R&D category directors. Um, so, you know, if it falls within pain and cardio, they'll reach out to me. Do you guys have, you know, ongoing strategy that hits on this if we're running clinical trials? Um, and there'd have to be some sort of synergy there. Um, leaps probably wouldn't be the investment route if, if that's what we were getting at to, to funding a clinical. It's, it's an, an entirely different um, kind of tool that we would use. I, I hope that kind of answered the question. Um, yeah, so we have we have two more minutes and I, I, I'm just checking the chat. There are a few questions we haven't answered yet. So I could either take um, two of those or if there is anything, any other comment from participants, um, now is your chance to say, to, to, raise, your, to raise your hand. Um, one question was, was, was uh, Norel, I think that was quite interesting. It's about like, um, are we also interested as buyer in the area of, um, of wellness? And um, so what are then um, areas for partnerships um, in that space we, we, we would be open? Maybe you could comment on this one a bit. So, so first of all, yes, we are interested in wellness. Um, I think everybody is at this point. Um, what I tell people when they ask what we're interested in, um, I try to typically flip the, uh, the conversation and say, look at our brands, okay? Look at the brands that we have. Look at the brands that you're familiar with and put on your consumer hat and think about what would be really cool for you to see with one of your favorite brands. Um, you know, those in the U.S., you guys all know Claritin, right? What would you love to see Claritin do? What as a consumer could you see a natural synergy um, you know, some sort of adjacent innovation, even like a transformational innovation coming from that brand. Um, so are we interested in wellness? Absolutely. Across every single category from, you know, pain, cardio to nutritional to digestive health, dermatology. Um, and I'd say, try to think about our brands and how you could envision kind of a, a natural transition into wellness. Um, but yeah, reach out to us. Super, super cool category, covers everything. Um, yeah very interested. And I mean, particularly this year, right? I mean, the important oh, yeah. care of your own health hasn't been more important. I mean, yep. more obvious before, I think. So everyone has, has, has been thinking, how can I, how, what can I do for my own health? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, as we are now coming to, to slightly to the end of our discussion, so let me, let me uh, just thank you for the great engagement, for all the comments, the questions, the engaged discussion that was super, super helpful for us, super insightful. Thanks for being so open. And uh, we are really looking forward to keeping in touch and engaging going forward. And as we said in the beginning, um, the external innovation and partnering team is there for you. Um, I also uh, would like to invite you, if you want to learn more about us, you can also visit our virtual booth. Um, we also have a YouTube channel on the Bio YouTube a platform on Partner With Us, where you can watch all the videos we have been referring to. Plus, we have the, um, the email partner with us at bio.com. So if you have an idea, kind of maybe you got inspired by Norel's um, comments, uh, do get in touch. I wish you an inspirational rest of the health bench show and um, most importantly, stay healthy. And over to you, Matt, for the closing.
Fantastic, fantastic. Well, uh, a big thank you to uh, to, to Bayer Consumer Health for, for hosting this session, uh, to Christina and Norell and, and Stephen for their excellent contribution. And thank you to everyone that's uh, joined in the discussion, uh, made comments and, and asked questions. Uh, hopefully there's some, some really interesting takeaways there for, for you, uh, for everyone that was in attendance today. Um, as Christina mentioned, if you do have any further questions for any of the Bayer team, you can visit them uh, at their virtual booth or reach out to them individually uh, via our meeting platform. Uh, a reminder, we've still got a full day ahead uh, of us at the HealthSpan show. Uh, lots of content available both live and on demand and indeed all, all for the rest of this week. So do get involved in that if you can. Uh, for now, though, a big thank you again to our contributors and for everyone involved in this discussion. Uh, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day.